this is this is Tokyo in in 2020s. You change this much in the uh, how many years now? 75 years, three quarters of a century, and it dawned on me um, some years ago that I was actually born only 12 years after this. And what's 12, 12 years? Think about it. Actually, 12 years ago from now in 2010, the first iPad was launched, right? Julia Gillard became the prime minister of Australia. And then WikiLeaks, that's 12 years ago. In 12 years, what do you think would have changed in Japan? Well, I wouldn't know. But when I grew up, that was the kind of Japan I knew. Well, not quite that, but uh, yeah, if you step outside of Tokyo, you, can, you could find quite a few of these sorts of uh, houses. And uh, in fact, I still remember there was one house that was just like that around the corner from where I was living. But now it's like that. And that was in the 60s when I was uh, in primary school. And um, the bullet train, that was the first generation bullet train. And the, uh, that's now. That's 65 years or maybe 60, 50 years. And that was the kind of things I was watching. And uh, yeah, you, you can see the change and the graphics and actually the sophistication of these sorts of things that's changed so much over the years. So one of the threads that Dilton was talking about was really change and dynamics. It really changes. You might not think so if you're in your 20s, but uh, I'll assure you, by the time you get to my age, it'll change. And um, I went to this uh, rather weird school um, for my secondary schooling education. It's called the um, Tokyo Kyoeku Daigaku Fuzoku Komaba Chugaku and Koko. That is the affiliated uh, secondary school um, to the um, educational university. In Japan, there is sort of two strands, used to be uh, two strands of university system. One for the general um, education at the tertiary level, and the other is for teacher uh, training. And the uh, this school was affiliated with that teacher training colleges. And the, um, as such, it was actually an experimental school. So they tried a new sort of a curricula on us, the students. We are selected by examination and so on. And the, uh, um, <laughs> they still seem to do it. We were told to do a rice paddy work when we were in the first year, I think. So when I was uh, 12 years old, we're, we're sort of sitting in that uh, rice paddy and uh, you try to do something um, for the year and uh, you're supposed to be looking after the growth of the rice. Anyway, um, but that's a weird school because the, um, <laughs> we are taught the algebra and the uh, uh, matrix algebra. And come to think of it now, it's a sort of like an elementary treatment of vector calculus. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, I sort of moved fairly naturally into calculus and differential equations and the analysis sort of line of things, um, not quite into more a, a ab abstract algebra kind of way, but analysis way. And but at the same time, we were introduced to this book by um, Otsuka Hiso. He is a, a historian, a Japanese historian. And uh, it was um, a kind of writing about the uh, changes in a community life. And uh, yeah, so if you're familiar with the uh, sort of uh, general change from the community to society and the uh, you know, um, social science writing about it, so you probably guess what sort of things he was writing about. But the, uh, his main um, theoretical back backbone came from Marx and um, Weber. And this book was actually a lecture note for university students that was given to us. And we were told, read it, <laughs> understand it, and do your exam. 
Anyway, so that was kind of a um, baptism by fire. But you can see that there's a kind of weird mixture of a natural science and social science. And this is not so much history as a description of concrete events, as more theoretical treatment of how society changes. And the, um, um, so the second thread, I would say, is a, um, um, a, using German word, and in fact, that's a Diltai who introduced this kind of a clear distinction. That's Geistens Wissenschaften and Naturwissenschaften. Basically, spiritual or um, cultural science, sciences, and natural sciences. And if you're familiar with C.P. Snow's uh, writing about two cultures, the two cultures, as humanities versus science, they sort of more or less map onto. But the, um, um, the way the uni university and high school education was set up in Japan was very much based on this distinction. You have the science course or the humanities course. And you have to make a choice at the uh, a secondary school, which way you go. I couldn't really make up my mind. <laughs> and along the way, though, I was reading, I was a sort of a, a sinophilia, and I was reading um, the uh, books. So, uh, if you are familiar with those uh, kind of Chinese books, this is a uh, um, it's a it's a writing by Sima Chen, the uh, said to be the very first person who wrote history in China, um, and uh, his translation into Japanese. I was re reading something like that as well. It's a weird combination. And um, it really sort of set up a kind of a um, dichotomy I had to live with uh, for the rest of my life. On the one hand, we have this humanities type of orientations, which are dealing with human activities. And it deals with history, politics, economic activities, and culture, and all the rest of it. And uh, epistemologically, it's really dealing with a, a, what some people might call interpretivism. What you're trying to achieve is an interpretation of people's activities and they um, understand human action. It's an understanding, verse 10, that is really the goal of your analysis. And methodologically, highly qualitative. You don't use equations. People are, are kind of almost uh, proud of not knowing how to understand equations. On the other hand, the naturalist and natural sciences, uh, of course, it deals with natural phenomena and uh, your mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. All those sorts of things are, are, are taught <laughs> by secondary school, actually, come to think of it. And the, uh, uh, epistemologically, it's an, a clear sense of empiricism and perhaps rationalism in the sense of a, a rational deduction model. And finally, it is really a kind of seeking causal explanation, making use of methodologically quantitative and experimental methods. So that's the kind of um, dichotomy that say, I was introduced to, or actually it was implicit in the curriculum itself. And of course, um, that's the kind of thing that the, uh, um, I was a, a, a living with. Um, at that point, and uh, yeah, I got into this uh, university called the University of Tokyo, which is probably the largest and perhaps the most prestigious <laughs> university in Tokyo. And uh, um, um, I chose to study law for various reasons. Um, a lot of my friends thought uh, I'll be going into the uh, mathematics or some other sorts of more computational uh, uh, sort of disciplines. But uh, probably if I didn't have the kind of life circumstances I had then, I might have gone into applied mathematics or something like that, but they, I didn't and I went into law. And, the, uh, I, and this is the University of Tokyo and the, uh, that's a famous red gate. And the, uh, I was introduced to uh, the writings of these two men. One is the, again, the same guy, Hisao Otsuka, the historian. And the, uh, the other guy is the, um, Masao Mariyama. He's a polit political scientist, but both of them 
we're really dealing with the grappling with the um, how Japan um, as a, a a modern nation had to cope with the influx of influences coming from the Western countries, especially from Europe, um, and they uh, are later on in uh, from the United States. And um, um, while studying law, I really had to deal with this question. And the, I wasn't a very good student, but the basic thing I got out of it and I was fascinated by is the very fact that the Japanese legal system is in fact a hybrid. It's not the uh, a traditional indigenous Japanese legal system that grew out of the uh, history of Japan itself, but rather it's combined with the uh, Western legal system and legal institution. And the, um, um, it, uh, the common understanding that people had about the Japanese legal system was largely based on this indigenous understanding of how the system contract and things like that would work rather than the um, imported notion of the um, law. And um, so there's a consistent and almost systematic deviations of the uh, a common understanding um, from the what was taught at the university, and that was um, a practice um, as a legal institution in Japan. Yeah. Right. So um, maybe it's a question, but so why is the legal system that way? Like, was it imposed on Japan after World War II in No, the uh, wasn't the imposition, but the uh, Japan um, was forced open by Perry, <laughs> the uh, U.S. Uh, fleet. And um, um, and then at that point, uh, there's a lot of violent crash actually, um, and the, uh, there's a, a lot of a um, angst of a importing um, Western influences, um, but they, um, at the same time, there's a realization that they you know that got to do something about it. Otherwise, um, there's a huge difference in terms of the ability to produce goods and services at that point already. It was 1868. Yeah, I think it was 1868 that the uh, imperial power was uh, restored and the uh, Japan opened uh, the country. And the, um, um, at that point, there was a huge difference. Um, in Europe and North America forged ahead after the uh, Industrial Revolution and they uh, changed the, uh, the production system and consumption system entirely. Right? And a, it was just only about a hundred years difference, but 100 years made a huge difference at that point. And the uh, Japan, um, many of the people realized that we got to learn those sorts of things, otherwise they are going to be poor and they wouldn't be able to compete. Anyway, um, so that's part of the reason why the legal institution, and other sorts of governance systems of governance were introduced in Japan. And in fact, Tokyo University was established as a, an instrument for it. So um, the, and what I realized while I was sort of uh, struggling through it was a, um, there's a really different systematic differences about the ways in which the notion of the person or the uh, human decision-making and the notion of contract, for instance, was a, um, conceptualized between the legal system and the, the common folk understanding of it. Um, just to give you a, a very simple example, um, this is called um, hanko, the inkan. It's just a stamp. And the, um, in Japan, I think to this day still, many of the people think that the, a contract will not be legally established until you put your stamp on the written document, which is not true actually legally. The, legally, when somebody makes an offer and you say, yes, I would like to have it and that way, that establishes actually the contract. And it's just a question of how to demonstrate it if some sort of a dispute comes in. And so that is not a, a constitutive element of a construct, contract at all, but people think that is the case. That kind of simple difference, but it sort of um, implies that the 
saying something and uh, accepting it and, and as a promise and the um, expressing an intention and expressing an intention to accept it that is sufficient to establish a contract the importance of intention seems to seem to me was one of the fairly central aspect of the difference and I, i've been struggling with it ever since but anyway um, so um, at that point, it became um, clear to me that the, um, there's something like culture and the, there's an institution like law. And they, um, um, that is much more stable aspect of what we generally call culture. And they are much more solid, like a legal system with the organizational backup and the government and all the rest of it. And there's a brick and mortar, right, <laughs> surrounding the organization that carry out institutions. And the, um, the, the conceptualization about the person, how do we understand a human being? And that became a sort of like a, um, a mantra for me. So that was Tokyo. And I, at that point, I moved to Santa Cruz. And the, uh, the reason why I went there is this man, his name is M. Brewster Smith. Um, he was a APA president and a, a well-known social psychologist and the personality psychologist. But the, um, uh, so he wrote um, um, a book called the, um, what is it? Uh, um, Opinion and Personality, I think it is. Um, but the, uh, he is, best known probably as a theorist of a um, functional theory of attitudes. And uh, he did uh, qualitative research about the um, um, Americans' attitudes towards Russia and uh, wrote about the uh, psychological um, underpinnings, especially needs-based analysis of the um, um, attitude. And uh, um, he was say, actually at Santa Cruz uh, and I kind of in a weird way um, related to me by marriage, um, but uh, yeah, there's no blood relationship as you can see, obviously. Um, and so yeah, it was a beautiful place, right? So if you know anything about Santa Cruz, then probably it's, you know what it's like, right? You, I, I, I got there in 1979. And you walk around on campus, and even in the daytime, you can smell the sweet smell of what you know, you know what, right? <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was uh, um, where Gregory Bateford used to be at as well. And so it's an ecology and kind of fuzzy and touchy feely of great stuff, you know. <laughs> I enjoyed a lot. But um, um, a one thing that I I really sort of uh, uh, got me thinking really hard was uh, his writing about perspectives on self -work. Um That was published in American Psychologist. I'm still sort of using it as a basis of a lot of my thinking as well. But say, um, uh, it's not very well known, but I think it is a, a very insightful writing um, of the man who has been struggling with this sort of a, um, I guess conflict between natural science and uh, um, and the uh, humanities, uh, cultural science, and um, um, while I was there, I was introduced to this um, kind of a micro macro issue, um, culture as a macro level um, analysis and phenomenon, and individual psychology at the micro level and how they relate to each other. And while I was there for two years, I was reading um, books like uh, Clifford Goethe's The Interpretation of Cultures and uh, another Japanese book um, that's a uh, social anthropologist by the name of, of uh, Chie Nakane. She is, I think, the first female professor uh, in at Tokyo University. <laughs> anyway, uh, she was educated in... Uh, I can't remember, I think it was Oxford, and they came back and they um, uh, was doing the usual sort of a British social anthropology analysis of kinship and family and so on. But they, she turned that analytical lens to Japan and Japanese culture and society. And they gave a very um, insightful 
I think, analysis of a Japanese society uh, from a, a kind of a, from the perspective of a type of social network analysis, how people relate to each other. And that's basically um, a social anthropologist um, a perspective of kinship, for instance. And Clifford Gates, on the other hand, is an American a symbolic anthropologist who is writing about culture as if it is a text. And the, um, a culture is, from that perspective, is a kind of like a, a open text um, writing that you can read and interpret and understand. So this is a very much a kind of a um, Geisler's Wissenschaft and humanities oriented approach to social science and culture. And they, at the same time though, um, I was you know, talking with this guy and um, basically a social psychology of a um, North America, which is, has a rather different sort of angle, but at the same time, um, probably was more sympathetic at that campus uh, to this kind of a uh, social science. And the, um, um, after that, uh, following Brewster's a, um, uh, the recommendation, went to Urbana-Champaign um, to study uh, cross-cultural psychology with this man. Um, his name is Harry Triandis, probably not very much known to you, but uh, yeah, in the area of culture and psychology, he's probably regarded as a giant. And uh, he was one of the first people who did the, yes, a lot of systematic research about cross-cultural differences and thinking about uh, differences. Uh, uh, culture, culture's effects on psychology very systematically. Um, anyway, um, he, he, he wrote uh, this paper called The Self and Social Behavior in Preferring Cultural Contexts. It was published in Psychological Review in 1989. And uh, I think a lot of people are still working out of this paper. So 30 years or more after this, um, there's, there are two things that have now been fairly well researched, individualism and uh, tightness. And the, um, the third one that he was talking about, the culture, the complexity, I think, um, that was, that's beginning to be explored at this point. So that was in many ways, um, a paper that sort of set out the a framework for a lot of research and there was since then. And the uh, well-known paper by Marcus and Kitayama on culture and self, that sort of um, fall into this framework, although probably Marcus and Kitayama's paper is better known. Anyway, still, this paper is pretty well cited. The, um, what um, you can see there is the thread of the uh, self. And the understanding about the self, of course, has to be couched within a cultural conceptualization of what the person is. I mean, because you know, the self, you, are considered to be a person. So um, culture and individual, individual, and this kind of anal analytical lens was deepened. And perhaps I was given a lot more a, a methodological and theoretical tools to think about it and uh, uh, analyze at this uh, PhD program. And uh, almost um, by chance, the, um, I was introduced to a bunch of uh, social psychologists who are researching a small group dynamics. And the, uh, in fact, uh, Illinois at the time had the uh, four major um, small group researchers. And probably that had, was the uh, largest concentration. A, and they, um, um, they're writing about the uh, group decision-making and the uh, social dilemmas and uh, cooperation competition and how the group performance and so on are in fact the um, a result of the uh, social interaction and the uh, social influence. And the, um, um, that kind of a small group analysis or dynamics perspective was a very, significant part of my PhD training. And I, um, uh, another thing that I, I uh, had to do was multivariate analysis. Uh, that's Maurice Tatsuoka. He's a, a, a Japanese-American guy. 
um, uh, who taught us the uh, multivariate and, uh, statistics. But uh, yeah, I started with the uh, um, matrix algebra, <laughs> and, uh, did the whole gamut. And the, um, at the end of the semester, you said, OK, we are going to have an exam. So you, you, it, you have two hours to complete. And we sat down and started working on it. Shit, Maurice, I don't think we can finish it in two hours. And uh, you, we kept pleading, well, give us more time. Right? We know what this is. It's just that the, you're asking for a lot and ended up spending six hours to complete the exam. He said, kind of started, kind of, oh, no, you should finish it. But kept saying, all right, we'll do whatever you want. And anyway, most of us did fairly well, but it was a six hour exam. Um, those are the days. And the, another thing that really sort of kept um, uh, me going was say, uh, actually French semiotics. <laughs> and the, uh, probably uh, it was in the early 80s and um, um, the French sort of intellectualism uh, began to spread out of, uh, of uh, France. Um, you probably know about the uh, Levi Strauss's uh, structuralism and so on that was uh, yeah, being translated in, into English and of course the Japanese as well. And uh, subsequent um, intellectual developments in that country um, uh, began to spill out of uh, France. And the, um, I had the uh, uh, luck, I suppose, of a, uh, being introduced to the book by A.J. Greymas, which is called Structural Semantics, but it's really about the narrative semiotics how to analyze the narrative text um, in terms of a, um, a semiotic structure. And he has a very structured approach to the analysis that really sort of helped me um, establish the ways in which I can understand and interpret a lot of text. And I, um, to this day, again, um, I think about the narrative in his terms. I, um, but anyway, I, so those are the kind of intellectual uh, inputs that I got, got, and still not much of an output, but I was just absorbing, absorbing, absorbing. And um, from there, um, we migrated to uh, Brisbane, Queensland. By the way, actually, I found my wife in Illinois mm -hmm. and still married to this day. <laughs> and uh, we had a first baby and uh, uh, she was, how many months? Three months? I think three months old when we moved to Brisbane. Anyway, actually, the reason why we, we, we went there was this man, Michael Humphreys. He was visiting his father, Lloyd Humphreys, when um, Lloyd was about to retire. And the, uh, uh, there was a conference, and Michael was attending, and the, uh, there was a job going at UQ. And he said, well, if you're in the job market, it's not a bad place. You might be interested in coming over and sort of applied there and a few other places. Um, and they gave me the best offer. So went to Queensland. Well, the best offer, though, wasn't a, a tenure track job. It was a, um, a kind of contract job for five years. And the, um, I, so I could have stayed there for five years, but I couldn't go any longer. It might have been uh, um, extended. Um, um, but say, um, anyway, so that was a deal. And we went there with a, th a three month old baby and uh, my wife, and uh, yeah, she was still completing a PhD, right? Anyway, um, the, that's where um, I was introduced to Ray Pike writing about the uh, convolution and matrix distributed memory model. And also um, he was writing with Ray and uh, also John Bain. Um, the, uh, it's basically a tensor product model of the memory and distributed memory model that really covers a lot of a episodic, semantic and procedural tasks. And uh, he was the one who really sort of got me thinking that really what psychologists are doing uh, requires a lot of task analysis, what the task is, what the task demand is, and what that sort of requires a person to do. But if you think about it, a lot of a, a sort of human activities are like that. The environment demands a certain task to be performed. If you understand what the task is, the nature of the task is, perhaps 
the range of things that people can possibly do may be constrained. And that way you can begin to constrain the kind of psychological processes that might happen given the circumstance. And that was a kind of a, a very significant shift for my thinking. And the, um, um, to think about things like culture and society and uh, interactions with other people, all those things as a kind of like a task demand in a way, it's a very strange way of saying it, but it's, it's sort of like a, if you uh, use a different words, it's affordances. The environment provides certain affordances and that constrain what you need to do. And then what you, how you deal with them, the demands is up to you. In many ways that can give you a choice. Um, but a, a culture helps you to come up with almost like a default choice that you can use to deal with it. Anyway, so um, while I was there, I was introduced to this psychology dynamics and distributed memory. And the, um, um, of course, uh, these parallel distributed processing books, uh, the two volumes came out in 1986. <laughs> and uh, we were reading these sorts of things. And, and uh, yeah, I was really taken by that. And uh, yeah, um, this is another man, uh, Michael Siegel, a developmental psychologist, a Canadian, um, who um, sort of taught me how to write a paper <laughs> to publish. Anyway, um, he eventually moved to uh, uh, England and uh, Sheffield. Unfortunately, he passed away some years ago. But um, um, he, he is another memorable, important mentor for me uh, from Queensland. Anyway, so I moved from there to Melbourne and first to La Trobe. Um, the Margaret Foddy was the person who hired me and the, um, um, she was uh, writing about uh, things like gender equality, inequalities and the um, um, uh, status characteristics. She was a, a sociological social psychologist. And of course, um, sociological social psychology deals with very similar sort of issues, but has much stronger interest in institutions like law and gender inequality and how institutionally these sorts of um, prejudices and the uh, discrimination might be um, embedded in a broader society. And the, um, uh, she introduced me to writings of uh, Anthony Giddens and a few others um, from sociological tradition. Beautiful campus still, um, but the, um, um, it, the 10 years I was there was probably in many ways that uh, gave me a chance to read many things and think about lots of things and uh, gave me a really solid starting point for doing a lot of work. Um, so this, at this point, I began to think about social interaction as a social psychologist, I'd be interested in social interaction as a cultural transmission and the uh, a social structuration. This might be a strange word many of you haven't heard about, but a structuration is the notion that say, Anthony Giddens came up with. And basically he's saying that the um, um, everyday routinized activities that we carry out, uh, in fact, influenced by a social structure at the institutions, sure. But what we do, in fact, recreate in many cases the institutions that constrain our behavior to begin with. So it's really that the everyday activities are, are producing the social structure as we act. And the notion of structuration is that we need to understand how the process of creating and recreating these social systems is what we need to look at. And the, uh, he was sort of writing about these sorts of things in his book, I think 79 publication, Central Problems in Social Theory. And um, um, at the same time, I was introduced to this book, remembering uh, that's Bartlett's, S.D. Bartlett's um, famous book on memory. But uh, if you think about it, that remembering book was really about uh, um, how uh, psychological, cognitive, and social processes 
cons contribute to the memory process. And the, um, in that book, he was writing about the uh, repeated um, uh, reproduction, the method of repeated reproduction, and also the method of serial reproduction. The former is that, that the uh, one person is given a stimulus and repeatedly uh, reproducing or remembering what was taught. But the, in the latter case, the theory of reproduction, it's not just one person, but the multiple people are involved in the reproduction of the uh, original stimulus. And the, um, that involves the cultural transmission, as you can imagine. And also it involves some degree of social processes. And the, uh, I think the subtitle has some sort of a, some reference to social psychology in it, actually, if you look at it uh, carefully. And the, another book that I, I encountered was this book by um, Herb Clark, Using Language. And I still think it's 1996 book. Um, the, it's, I still think it's a, a great book. It sort of introduced me to the idea that actually language use is a co coordination game. And uh, yeah, that sort of opened my eyes to this possibility of thinking about ev evolutionary game theory and uh, yeah, thinking about social uh, processes within the framework of a um, game theoretic frame, a, a theoretical apparatus. And the, uh, that was kind of interesting, although I sort of felt, hmm, this shouldn't be everything, <laughs> right? This, I, uh, the dichotomy that I was carrying in my mind, the uh, natural science and the cultural science, that sort of kept coming back to me and said, yeah, that's right, interesting, but not quite. Right, anyway, so that's that. And in the meantime, I got involved in this uh, association called the International Association for Cross-Cultural Psychology. Um, eventually, I became the president and the, uh, wrote papers about the conceptualization of culture and person and so on. As you can see, I was still sort of stalking that notion of conceptualization of the person. Anyway, so that was the, uh, um, the that's been ongoing. I'm still involved in it. I got involved in the uh, kind of hairy situation <laughs> over the last week and two. Anyway, it's still going. And, and the, uh, in the meantime, though, um, um, we began to do some research about the culture and self. And the, uh, from the very beginning, I was very much concerned about the agenda issue as well. But around the time, around the time when the uh, uh, this sort of research was being done, um, the, the self-concept was thought of in terms of more individualistic and uh, versus more uh, collectivistic or relational um, to sort of a, a social emphasis. And the, uh, um, from that kind of a, a dichotomous view of the world, um, gender difference and cultural differences seemed almost identical, right? And North Americans are individualistic, right? East Asians are more collectivistic. All right, okay, that's, that's fine. And men are meant to be individualistic or agentic, and women are meant to be more relational or perhaps collectivistic. How are they different? I have no idea. And, and the literature really didn't give us a lot of clues about it. And so um, we did the uh, five culture study of the uh, Amer Americans, Australians, and the Hawaiians, and Koreans and Japanese. And just to cut the long story short, basically the cultural dimensions and the gender dimensions are different. They are located uh, in different aspects of self-concepts. And uh, yeah, um, really the cultural difference um, Australians and mainland US on the one hand, and Japan and Korea on the other, and Hawaiians in, sitting in the middle. That um, cultural difference is really about the extent to which people thought of themselves as an um, individual agent and doing things on their own. And the uh, um, gender difference, male, female, male, female, the successful Koreans, was located on more about uh, uh, what we are now calling relational aspect 
that is to say whether you understand yourself as in some way a relationship in relationship with somebody else so if you think of yourself as a father to a son or a mother to a daughter well that's a relational way of thinking about it. whereas if you think about the um, yourself as a member of a family or the king group or a bigger a group church whatnot well then that's a group-based sort of a collectivism and those two seem to be related correlated but not identical yep right, i'm just trying to understand this graph i'm looking at ideas and ideas the same as female males mm -hmm. but the way you describe that would suggest that females compared to males are, are more concerned about the agentistic and they're less concerned about relationships is, is that oh no no this is the actually relation and that's agentic sorry oh, okay. this is more relational than down okay. say more so the males are more concerned about yeah, that's right. The Hawaiians are a little bit so yeah, but anyway. But generally speaking, males were agentic and the females were um the uh, no put it let me put it this way. Actually females were a lot more relational than men. Okay. So um and I discovered that actually Brewster Smith and Harry Triandis were involved in some kind of a, a joint conference going. And both of them were um, actually attending some sort of a conferences even before then um, with the Amri Tashva um, as part of the uh, mission to cultivate um, um, understanding. I think it includes Don Campbell as well, um, understanding in the social context of Africa um, in the early 70s. Um, anyway, a, their kind of influences came through in this sort of research, and since then I've been working on it. But the um, uh, Michael Humphrey's influence came through over here too. Um, we began to think about the uh, uh, different ways in which um, impressions are formed, but uh, especially about the group impressions are formed, how people understand our social groups, and based on a, a series of stimuli. Uh, given to you about the uh, the group of individuals, and the uh, um, there was a two clearly different um, uh, tasks, if you like, in social psychology, which came from largely um, cognitive psychology, especially the categorization one. That's really about the uh, learning categories, and you're given an exemplar, and they uh, try to categorize that exemplar to one category or the other. Right? That's a categorization task. But the impression formation task that came largely from social psychology was really about the um, a stimuli, a series of stimuli given to you about a group. And uh, you're trying to form an impression about the, pers the person, about the group, and so on. And the, um, um, but <laughs> if you look at them, they look very similar, and yet they are very different. Um, generalized context model is actually a multiplicative model, right, of the similarities. And the uh, impression formation judgment is not a multiplicative, but the, um, an additive model or averaging model. And then how can we understand those two divergent understandings? Well, actually, distributed memory model, the, the uh, tensor product model gave me a solution. That's a, um, a, depending on how the same memory representation is accessed, actually a, the resultant judgment or categorization performance um, fall out a, of the same underlying representation. But what's different is the task demand and the uh, uh, retrieval processes that are involved. And the, um, uh, that was kind of in line very much with the uh, Michael Humphreys line of thinking about the task analysis. Around the time uh, when I was writing about these sorts of things, um, I, I, I got roped into this uh, uh, adventure by these three men. Um, it, they, this guy, Wicho Kim, is a Korean. I wanted to launch a new association called the Asian Association of Social Psychology. I was probably the, the least enthusiastic and they, uh, um, there's this guy, um, Kok Lung, uh, from Hong Kong. He was actually um, a classmate from Illinois. 
And uh, another man, Sister Yamaguchi, um, he's uh, slightly older than us, but uh, he yeah, uh, was already uh, relatively better established in Tokyo as well. So those two guys had the, a fairly good um, institutional backup. Um, Wichel was uh, yeah, uh, beginning to start his career, and uh, yeah, I was kind of uh, struggling to produce papers, right? Okay. And the, uh, um, anyway, we launched this journal, Asian Journal of Social Psychology, um, two years later, and it's still continuing um, 25 years later. So that's the kind of a professional involvement I began to have. And the um, um, became pretty much part of my life, <laughs> really. You know, when something happens, I get roped into it, and they um, um, somehow um, feel obliged to do something um, with them. Anyway, um, while I was at uh, La Trobe, I think I... Oh, I'm sorry. So I'll finish in a few minutes so, uh, quickly. Um, in 2000, I moved to Melbourne. And, and that was a great move. I really I wanted to move, actually, because the main um, attraction was actually Pitt. And uh, yeah, I wanted to learn more about social network analysis and uh, your perspective and so on. And soon after, Gary Robbins joined and the, um, um, also Nick Haslam joined. And the, uh, those three people, and it's probably um, you know, Pitt moves on to become uh, administration most, mostly, but uh, Gary and Nick uh, became a, a very important um, intellectual sounding board and collaborators in my research. And at the same time, I was introduced to these two books. Um, one is by Cavalli Sforza and Feldman. It's a mathematical treatment of cultural evolution. And the other one is a similarly mathematical treatment of a uh, cultural evolution by Boyd and Richardson. And the, um, I was very taken by that. And I wish, I really wished I had known about it when I was doing undergraduate work or PhD work. But uh, yeah, anyway, so um, I got, uh, um, while I've been here, I learned something about the social networks and the um, uh, evolutionary game theory, um, especially from that book, Evolutionary Dynamics. And the, uh, the main influence um, was actually that guy, Toshio Yamagishi, a um, well-known sociologist. Anyway, the, um, from my perspective, social networks really gives me a meta theory that links micro level analysis and macro level analysis and the, uh, the meso level analysis that links the two. And the, uh, also it gives me a lot of methodological toolkit and that really got me going. But say uh, I'm not a social network analyst and not an expert in that, but I take that perspective as a very useful conceptual and methodological tools to generate ideas for research. Game theory, uh, I, I think I told you about that already. Food for thought. So a whole bunch of things that uh, I began to do empirically. Um, so the first one was the stereotypes and narratives and the um, um, Anthony Lyons and Hannah Clark I played a major role in thinking about it. And of course, this is a serial reproduction experiment, which came from the uh, um, the uh, Bartlett's uh, original uh, study. Yeah, I can read it. A study in experimental and social psychology. That's the subtitle of the book. Um, and they uh, also worked on emotion transmission, how emotion is transmitted and they uh, might diffuse through social networks and they, uh, how that might actually contribute to social structuration. And they um, um, worked on norms as well, and the, um, the, how social networks would um, influence the way we learn norms, and the, uh, also how social networks would influence the way we talk about norms and influence others. Um, and the, uh, um, I began to think more um, applied ways about the, um, a, the sorts of interface between cultural processes, cultural dynamics, and the uh, social network dynamics. And they uh, um, began to use these sorts of methodological tools to investigate things like climate change, communication, 
uh, risk communication after Fukushima Daiichi disaster and the um, uh, green talks uh, more generally about environmental uh, concerns, how we talk about it, and the um, uh, more, most recently about polarized discourse. And the, um, um, we've been working on this sort of mathematical treatment um, uh, of that uh, combining distributed memory models and um, network influence models as well. And these are all the collaborators. Um, and the, uh, of course, at the same time, the sustainability issue. It was, I think, 2007, or maybe a little earlier, I came across this climate change uh, report, and they, I thought, oh, shit, <laughs> got to do something about it. And they, uh, I was involved in this Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute that was established a little later, maybe 2008 or nine, I forget. Um, it's now closed, unfortunately, just this uh, last year. But anyway, these are the sorts of people I've been working with, a PhD students, and the um, um, more, more uh, broadly, I began to work on this cultural dynamics idea in social ecological systems. I mean, if you think about sustainability issues, you really have to think of a human society within the context of ecological systems and how ecosystem interacts with the human society, and the, uh, how both of them influence each other and constrain each other. And if we don't manage it well, kaput, right? So um, we began to work on it, and you're familiar with these sorts of people that I work with. And they, uh, um, of course, network and cultural dynamics in Silico, work with Michael Curley from um, computer science and Alex Stivala. Without them, I wouldn't have done, done any of these sorts of a large scale simulation work. And uh, most recently, I began to work with utopianism and future societies, how we think about these sorts of future possible futures and possible utopian um, ideal society and how they might in fact influence the way we act and perhaps hopefully change the society better. Anyway, so that's my family and that's to be continued. Right? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, um, yeah, okay. Right. Any questions? <laughs> you. Uh, so yeah, um, this is very cool. I have many questions, but I guess one of them is: it seems like. Um, just looking over this, except for the sort of wall thing, there was not any doubt throughout that you wanted to do academia and go into academia, and it was just about what, like you know, <laughs> um, is that is that a fair characterization, or did you? I think yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah, but when I went to the U.S., I wasn't sure if I was cut, cut out to do these sorts of work. Actually, I'm I'm the first generation university graduate. My father started it but the war cut it short so he never graduated and the, so i was the first uh, uh, graduate uh, from a, a university and the uh, around me there was no academic and I, uh, nobody who sort of uh, could tell me that actually you can do these sorts of research and just thinking about it and pondering and uh, you can make a decent life out of it and so i wasn't quite sure so uh, when I first uh, went to the US, I thought, well, at least I can learn English. Um, a, to be honest, um, when I was in a, a secondary school, I almost failed English. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, um, the lowest point was a, point, a score of 40 out of 100. That's just bare minimum. If you go to 39, you fail, right? <laughs> And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the teacher sort of uh, took pity on me and gave me 40 rather than <laughs> I managed to get 40. So uh, um, I thought, well, maybe by going there, I can learn English and uh, perhaps that might help me I mean, find a career, career in somewhere. And uh, yeah, I 
being a graduate from Tokyo Law actually meant that you can usually find a job in the um, uh, large corporations, or perhaps say if you take an exam, uh, you can become a bureaucrat and so on. That was the heyday of uh, of Japanese growth, right, in the 70s and early 80s. And the bubble bursted in the late 80s, but until that time, about 10 years, it was just like crazy. And Japan is number one, was one of the books that was published, <laughs> and so on. And the um, um, so I thought, well, maybe English, but um, I just couldn't resist it. I, I, as you can see, it's the people that I talk with, and it's the books or papers that I read. And those are the ones that engage me most. <laughs> Realize that, yeah, that, that's my life. <laughs> I have to do it. And so, yeah, I have no regrets. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Should we finish? Should we finish them? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>